time loops in movies. Ah, time loops. How lovely. And in particular, if you look at science fiction, there are time loops everywhere in movies like The Terminator. But movies like The Terminator don't have the kind of time loops I'm looking for, where each loop ends up being a little bit different, even to the point where you have different protagonists. So I went digging and looking for a pure time loop, where it's the same event happening over and over again. And then I ran into the Welcome TVA. To the Time Variance Authority. I'm Miss Minutes. Now, the TVA's mission is to preserve the sacred timeline, where there is one timeline, and any time there's any sort of divergence or variance, they come in, and then they snip it off. And there is one particular person who causes a lot of variance, and that is Loki. So he grabbed the Tesseract and made a run for it. And well, they didn't like that. And then if you've seen the show itself, then you know that they took a variant of Loki and they recruited him. Then after an escaped attempt and a betrayal, Loki was thrown into a time loop where we see him getting slapped again and again and again. And so this is a mathematics channel and you might be wondering what does somebody getting locked in a time loop and getting slapped over and over again have to do with anything in mathematics? Well there is this method called fixed point iteration where you take an input and you keep applying the same operation over and over again. And the objective is to show that with iterations of this operation you end up converging to some fixed point and in this case it's because I'm scared of being alone. It's an apologetic Loki. So fixed point iteration is something that gets used all the time in mathematics. And in particular, it shows up as early as when you are doing differential equations. This is how you get the existence of uniqueness theorem that is called the Picard's theorem. You know, this Picard. No, 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 sorry, uh, this Picard. Picard found an operation that if it had a fixed point, that it would actually be a solution to the differential equation. That operation can be seen here. And what we can do is we can go ahead and apply it. Let's say we apply it five times to a really bad guess, a constant function. This is what we end up getting. And what's really remarkable is that this is really the boneheaded approach to solving a differential equation. You don't need to know anything about how to solve a differential equation, none of the techniques, anything else like that. You just have to apply an integral. An integral is sort of the first thing you want to do if you want to invert that. So this ended up being like sort of your first approach to solving a differential equation. We can use this as a bit of inspiration in order to talk about, well, fixed point iteration in general. It is used to show that Newton's method will actually converge. It is used to solve differential equations. It is even used to make fractals. This is fixed point iteration. And so then the question is, what do you need in order to make fixed point iteration work? Well, first of all, you need a metric space. This is a set plus a way of measuring the distance between things in that set. So if it's two points on the plane, then it's just the measurement of their distance with a ruler. If it's say two continuous functions on an interval, then it is where they are the furthest apart. So that gives us our metric spaces, but we need something a little bit stronger. We need our metric spaces to be complete, which means that if we have a sequence that looks like it's gonna be converging, it is say bunching up somewhere, that there actually has to be something that it converges to. And then finally, we need something called a contraction. A contraction is this operation that we've been looking at here. And technically what we're asking is that it is an operation T where if you apply T to say two points out of your set, then it brings them closer together by some scale value alpha, less than one. And so now those are the elements that we need for a fixed point iteration, why don't we see if we can actually prove that fixed point iteration will converge at a fixed point. And that fixed point is a solution to whatever problem you have on hand. So now let's talk about the fixed point theorem. This basically says that if we have a contraction and a non-empty complete metric space, then you are guaranteed to have a fixed point of that contraction. And in fact, you can find that fixed point just by iterating your operation over and over and over again. This is actually a really easy thing to prove and this is called the Banach fixed point theorem. So the first thing that we need is to talk about what a Cauchy sequence is. So a Cauchy sequence is a sequence of points that looks like it's gonna be converging, but it is more than just having the distance between two adjacent points going to zero, because that can actually still lead to a divergent trajectory or a variance. And in this case, we want to stay true to the sacred timeline. And so we want to make sure that there is some envelope that everything's going to be staying underneath. And then as we go off 
further and further in a tail, that envelope's gonna be shrinking and going to zero. And so this is a Cauchy sequence, and this is where we're gonna be showing the sequence that we get by taking some initial point and applying this operation over and over and over again. And so we're gonna show it's a Cauchy sequence. And that means that it actually converges because a complete metric space is a space where every Cauchy sequence converges. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at this alpha that's less than one. And as we know that if we take powers of this alpha, it's gonna converge to zero. And so we're gonna use this in order to get a sort of upper bound on the entire tail of our sequence. And so what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be using this alpha in order to show that our tail is gonna be, say, squishing down. Why don't we just take a look at the difference between two adjacent points in our sequence. And so we have some t to the i against some initial point, say, x, and we'll have t to the i plus one against some initial point x. Now we know that this is t applied to, say, t to the i minus one applied to x, and t applied to t to the i of x. We can now strip away this t, and now we get an upper bound on this of alpha times the distance between t to the i minus one on x and t to the i on x. And if we keep doing this, we keep accumulating more and more alphas. So then we see we finally get this bound of alpha to the i times the distance between x and t to the x. And so this distance between x and t to the x is just gonna be a constant that we're not really gonna worry about. And what we really want is this alpha that is raised to some power i. Now, if we wanna show that an entire tail is encompassed in here, what we need to do is we need to pick two really far apart values off in the distance. And so we're gonna have, say, some n and some m that is larger than n. And we're gonna take a look at the distance between t to the n of x and t to the m of x. And what we're gonna show is that we can keep this under a uniform bound in terms of alpha and some power. And so now, since we know there's a whole bunch of points between t to the n of x and t to the m of x, we can actually expand this out using the triangle inequality. So we get this sort of upper bound now where we take a look at the distance between all adjacent points summed up all the way down until we get up to m. And now we can just take that operation that we did just a second ago and see that at the very start we have alpha to the n times the distance between x and t to the x, and at the very end, alpha to the m times the distance between x and t to the x. And so we can now factor out this constant that we talked about before, and we can also take that alpha to the n and we factor that out too. Now we see what's left over is just one alpha plus alpha squared all the way up until we get to alpha to the m minus n, and well, there's no reason to stop this here. We know we can get an, another upper bound on this by using the geometric series. And so we'll just add more values to this. And so now we can use the geometric series formula to get one over one minus alpha. So now there we go. We have a bound on this entire tail. So we know that if we look at that point that we get at t to the n applied to x, that no other point past that can diverge from that point itself by more than this upper bound that we got. And we see that since this upper bound is sort of dominated by this term alpha raised to the n, well, as n goes to infinity, that whole tail is narrowing down into a single point. And so now we know that the limit exists. And now I'm telling you that this is gonna be our fixed point. And that's not actually all that hard to see. So now we know that this limit exists. So now I can write this as the limit as n goes to infinity of t to the n of x. So now I can ask, what is t applied to this? Well, since t is a contractive mapping, that means it's also continuous. So that means I can pass the limit right through. So now what we see is that we have the limit as n goes to infinity of t to the n plus one of x. And well, that actually just is our whole sequence shifted over by one. And so it has the same limit. If we apply t to the limit of this sequence, then the result is the limit of that sequence. And so that's a fixed point. And we'll just call that limit y. And so, ta-da, we have just proved the fixed point theorem. Oh, yeah. my jet ski magazine put it down. Come on, you're up. There's been an attack. Let's go. Hey, so I want to thank you for sticking through to the end of this argument. And that is fixed point iteration. Oh, and I think we missed a couple of slaps. So if you want to see some more content, then might I suggest that you take a look at this video dedicated to inequalities and Zoolander.